If you are a landowner or have at all been involved in the forestry community the past few years, you've no doubt heard of forest carbon credits. These things are everywhere and it seems to be all anyone can talk about, at least on the institutional level. You go on LinkedIn and it seems like all the foresters have some sort of weird carbon certification in their resume. All the NGOs and landowner associations seem to be hosting uh, carbon seminars and so forth. And most importantly, it seems like every time I get online these days, I see some sort of ad from a brokerage offering to buy carbon on my land. So naturally, I've gotten a lot of questions from you guys. Is this legit? Is it a scam? And so on. I am here to tell you that this entire market is an absolute joke, but it could represent an opportunity for you. It could also be the absolute worst thing that has ever happened to forestry. So let's talk about this. First off, what exactly are forest carbon credits? Well, the idea is at least theoretically simple. You might have a firm that wants to be net zero in carbon emissions, and it does its best to try to reduce that on its own. Maybe it tries to upgrade technologies in its plants, uh, maybe it upgrades its vehicle fleet to electric, something like that. But at a certain point, it becomes either impossible or economically impractical to do so. And so they might resort to um, some sort of offsetting system. So for example, a direct way to do this would be to offer their employees incentives to install heat pumps in their homes, or maybe offer a 50% match on the purchase of a Tesla. Now that would be pretty awesome, but we kind of return to the economically unfeasible thing. Uh, it's pretty expensive to do something like that. And the good thing about atmospheric carbon, and also the bad thing, I suppose, is that it's global. It doesn't really matter where you offset carbon, it's going to have an effect globally. So naturally, the American business mind is going to resort to the solution it always does, globalism. Why would you try to solve the problem locally when you can just hire some people in the Philippines to plant mangroves for you for pennies on the dollar? But of course, it would be difficult to manage a project like that halfway across the globe. So instead, you have brokerages that offer to either manage or initiate such a project and then securitize those theoretical carbon offsets as a credit that can be bought and sold on an open exchange. So if that original firm really wanted to reach net zero emissions, theoretically all they would have to do is buy a credit to represent a certain amount of carbon offsets, presumably with a few clicks of a mouse, and uh, that would be that. Now these credits can take different forms. They can be the result of funding a renewable energy project, for example, or something like that. But what I really want to focus on is the idea of a forest carbon credit which is a carbon credit produced by the storage of carbon from forest growth. Within that category, you have three subcategories, which are, in order of honestly how much sense they make, are reforestation credits, which are credits generated by planting trees, preservation credits, which are credits produced by preventing deforestation, and then the most tenuous, the improved forest management credits, which come from a theoretical excess of carbon storage from changing forest management practices. For the most part, that last category is what's going to be available to you as an American landowner, so that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So the first thing you have to understand about these forest carbon credits is they really are not for you. They were never intended to be used in the context of a developed economy because they make little to no sense in that context. And that's because deforestation is simply not a widespread issue in the United States. Deforestation is an issue that's closely linked to developing agrarian economies and that is not what we are. And for that exact same reason, we don't have a whole lot of land available for reforestation. All of our unforested land is, for the most part, locked in either development or highly productive agricultural land. Second, our timber in the United States is some of the most valuable in the world, not because of the species or anything like that, but simply because it's sold on the local market and denominated locally in United States dollars. So inherently, it's going to be difficult for these carbon credits to compete with timber production within the United States. Compare that to forest land in Colombia, where the timber is sold for Colombian pesos. Uh, in that situation, there really is no competition. It makes a lot more sense to sell carbon credits denominated in United States dollars, where there's really no intermediary except for the brokerage itself. So this market really is not for you. They're originally supposed to be like save the rainforest credits, but even in that context, they've been absolutely plagued by issues. So much so that it's been estimated that at least 90% of these credits have been absolutely worthless, just representing something that doesn't exist. Now these problems have included selling multiple credits from the same parcel of land, uh, not honoring contracts and commitments, and perhaps most prominently, the issue of carbon leaks. 
So to understand what a carbon leak is, imagine putting your hand in front of a small stream. Where does the water go? Unless you have a really good seal on that stream, the water's either just gonna go around your hand or over your hand. And that's exactly what happens to deforestation pressures if land is preserved. If one parcel of land is protected, those harvesting pressures just go around to the surrounding unprotected property. And we've actually seen this with conservation efforts within the United States. Back in the 1990s, there was something that was famously called the spotted owl controversy in the Pacific Northwest. Long story short, you had some environmental activists that sued the United States Forest Service to halt its logging operations on its public holdings of land in the Pacific Northwest, claiming they weren't properly valuing the habitat for the endangered spotted owl. The courts agreed and logging was subsequently halted on, I believe, 80% of its land out there. However, this was the 1990s, right at the beginning of America's housing boom. So we had an insatiable appetite for two by fours and two by sixes. And so all that harvesting pressure just leaked away to private lands. And because out there private and public land is in a checkerboard pattern, we can see the effects over time very clearly. Now, if you wanna know why land out there is in a checkerboard pattern, it was the dumbest land subsidy you could possibly imagine. So anyway, that's the deal with these Save the Rainforest credits. But then someone thought, hey, there's a lot of money being thrown around. This could be a good opportunity for American landowners. So the entire program was kind of retrofit to fit American forestry practices. So that brings us to these so-called improved forest management credits, which again represent the most tenuous of all claims. Now these days there's a lot of programs out there being offered to landowners, so I thought the best way to do this would be to just look at one of the single programs being offered currently and really analyze it to show you the problems with all the assumptions being made. And uh, what I thought I'd look at is the Family Forest Carbon Program brought to you by the American Forest Foundation and the Nature Conservancy. And this is nothing against those guys, it's just that their ad is the one I've been seeing most frequently. So basically how the Family Forest Carbon Program works, and I'll leave a link to everything in the description if you wanna check it out, is you enroll your property for a contract period of 20 years. And over that entire 20 year period, you receive between $200 and $300 per acre. Now, during that 20 year contract period, that money you receive is to be used for certain silvicultural prescriptions and investments to improve the growth on your land. Meanwhile, you're heavily restricted in how much you can actually harvest or remove from your property. For example, you can't remove more than 25% of basal area from any single harvester over time. And honestly, that sounds untenably restrictive to me. Uh, that pretty much precludes the use of any standard harvesting equipment because that percentage would be eaten up by just the trails alone. And even on my land with my very light-footed equipment, um, I definitely removed more than 25% of basal area. And I was too light in my harvesting. I did not optimize for growth over the next 20 years, basically the next five years. But that's the least of my concerns. So what they do is they take your property and they match it up with a control property in the FIA database. So this is actually structured very similarly to how I have my growth estimation tool uh, set up in Silvicultural and for similar reasons. They can take your property and match it up to a similar property with the same age class, basal area, and so forth, and use that as a dynamic baseline. So then here's a nice infographic of what they expect to happen. Over time, relative to the dynamic control of the FIA data, your property, after implementing certain uh, forest management practice, is going to depart from that FIA average. And that excess of standing carbon is going to represent the carbon storage that uh, came from this particular intervention. And that is what produces the carbon credit. That excess is what can be sold on the open market for carbon offsets. This carbon, and this is key to understand, this carbon is sold because it is in excess of what was expected in the counterfactual business as usual scenario. What would have happened anyway? The problem is they aren't actually measuring anything remotely useful here. So let's get into why. Problem number one, how do you actually know how much carbon is on an acre of land? In traditional forest management, the goal, generally speaking, is to measure the wood volume in logs, which are the actual forest product. A log is a cylindrical object, or if you want to be precise, it's a truncated paraboloid. It's something that's very easy to model mathematically. But when we start talking about estimations of carbon and carbon models, we're not just talking about cylindrical objects. There is carbon in the logs, yes, but there's carbon in the treetops, and carbon in the branches, and carbon in the twigs, and carbon in the leaves, and carbon in the roots, and carbon in the soil. How do you possibly model that? 
Traditional forest measurement has been around for a very long time now, well over 100 years. It's tried and true. Nonetheless, it's extremely prone to errors from various sources. It is relatively easy to vastly overstate volume by just making a simple sampling error or making an incorrect assumption. And the thing with this traditional forest measurement is it does not matter. Uh, it does not matter how inaccurate a uh, forest inventory estimation is. Yeah, you're going to piss some people off, you might lose some clients, but that estimate is forever tethered to reality through an event known as the timber harvest. If that estimate is incorrect, reality will eventually rear its head. We're going to know. These carbon models can never leave the realm of theory. There is absolutely nothing tethering them to reality. Unless you absolutely dissect an acre of land and do complex chemical analyses on every little bit of it and do that across geography, you can never know if these models accurately represent reality. And by the way, that's equally true for the emissions side of the equation. So the chances you can reach net zero just by buying a few credits is zero. This, just from that alone, is an exercise in foolishness. But it gets worse. Next, let's look at the mechanics of these specific credits. Namely, the claim that departure from the FIA model is truly representative of a departure from the counterfactual. Now, to make my point here, I want you to close your eyes and visualize the person who enrolls their land in this program. Imagine somebody who's enthusiastic about enrolling their land into this program to fight climate change. Now, are they a man or are they a woman? How old are they? What did they do for work or what did they do for work? What are they wearing? Now, I want you to imagine that this person wakes up in the morning and pours a cup of coffee. You see something that's written on their mug. It says they donated to some organization. What organization did they donate to? Maybe you're thinking NPR, Planned Parenthood, perhaps. Now, I don't want to stereotype here, but this is not a quibble. This is actually extremely important. Is the person enrolling in this program truly representative of a randomized sample of American landowners, or do they already depart from that data? Is this somebody who is eager to just turn the key on the feller buncher and make some money, or are they mostly interested in just being a good steward to their land? Now, again, this is huge. The FIA data is more or less a randomized sample of land and thus landowners. People who enroll in this program are not random. They already have behavioral differences that depart from the normal population. Let's face it, in today's world, just throwing the word climate change out there is going to either attract or repel certain types of people based on nothing but that alone. And there are certain mechanics and features within this program that are only going to exacerbate this bias. So first off, I mentioned advertising. Uh, these guys have been advertising heavily on Facebook. Like I see their ad almost every time I open up uh, Facebook. The problem with that, and I say this as somebody who has spent well into six figures on Facebook ads in my life, so I understand the, the platform well, is that ad is going to be searching for the people most likely to convert, whatever they have for their conversion metrics. So these are people who are more likely to join the program, more likely to send you an email, more likely to engage with your ad, click on your link, whatever the um, objective might be. And once it starts getting data about the type of people who are doing that, it's going to selectively show the ad to just that group of people. And that's why it's kind of important to think of a caricature of who's enrolling in this program, because that's essentially how the algorithm of Facebook works. It's taking all this data and creating a caricature, and it's going to be showing your ad primarily to that caricature, which is going to enhance any bias that exists to begin with, because that's just economic marketing. If you only got a 6% conversion rate from the general population, but a 10% conversion rate by showing the ad to this caricature, obviously you're just gonna show the ad to the caricature. The other problem is, at least in Maine, they're offering two specific types of programs. The first program, which pays $200 per acre, is the Enhance Your Woodlands package. And that's a little more permissive. You can harvest more on it and so forth. Um, the other package, which pays $300 per acre, is the Grow Forest Older package. And there's a little note at the bottom of the information about that more um, valuable package that it's generally incompatible with state tax subsidy programs. So in Maine, we have the Maine Tree Growth Tax Law. And basically you get a subsidized tax rate, which is generally very cheap. 
uh, as long as you're actually using the land for forest management practices. And that requires periodic harvests. And so you can put your land into this more restrictive program that will grow forests older, but they're saying that it might disqualify you from these subsidy programs. So that inherently cancels the economics out, potentially to a net negative for the landowner. So what type of landowner are you attracting to that specific program? Is it somebody who is super concerned with their land as an investment, or is it somebody who sees their land more as a natural living work of art? Now, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's cool. I love to see it when people uh, love their land that much to see it and think of it as a work of art, but it is not the baseline. It is. It makes no sense to compare that person to the FIA control. They were going to want to grow their wood larger and for longer anyway um, without this program. The big problem here is that program pays more, presumably because it represents more carbon storage versus the baseline. But actually, because of that inherent behavioral bias in who is going to be interested in this program, it's probably more tenuous of a claim than anything. All right, so for the next couple points, I want to refer back to this graph here. And to be clear, I understand this is just a nice, silly little infographic. It's not meant to be precise. Uh, it's probably knowingly exaggerated in a couple places. Nonetheless, I think it does a good job of representing how this program works. So if we look down at the FIA baseline, we see peak and trough, and the troughs are represented by piles of wood, and these are representative of periodic harvests. Um, and so the standing carbon on the forest drops corresponding with that harvest. However, what happens to the carbon at that point? The assumption here, I suppose, is that it just kind of goes back into the atmosphere, but that's not what happens. These logs are turned into forest products, and forest products are a form of carbon storage. My parents' house was built in 1830, and if you look at the frame of that house, you can actually see saw marks from a water-powered up-down sawmill. So that house has been storing carbon for 200 years. All the while, that acre of land, I mean, depending on how the area was developed, because we don't really, can't say this for sure anyway, but um, that acre of land was then able to grow more wood and continue to sequester uh, carbon to be harvested for more wood products over that 200 year time period. And the house that was built from that original harvest has been offering shelter and protection to generations of families. And that's something we wanna see, right? We like it when families have homes. And especially in the modern era, when new construction is um, initiated, that construction represents a home that's dramatically more efficient than a home that was built in 1830, which is also a form of reducing carbon emissions. But that gets a little complicated. And outside the world of construction, there are other forest products which work well with other, if not climate friendly, than just generally environmentally friendly initiatives. For example, uh, biomass, which can be burned and actually used to produce electricity, which is much better than burning coal for electricity. Uh, in Maine, which this is stupid for other reasons, but they banned plastic bags and now we use paper for everything. Guess where paper comes from? Paper comes from trees. And then of course you have firewood and wood pellets, and even if you want to argue they aren't exactly perfectly carbon neutral, they're certainly better than oil. So the idea that you can look at these harvests as net emissions is just wrong. It makes no sense, but you can't properly account for that without potentially invalidating this entire project. All right, next one. And this one, honestly, I'm trying to still wrap my head around because I don't totally understand where they're coming from. Um, so if we look at this graph again, we can see that we are measuring on the FIA baseline a rolling average. We're getting trough and peak of standing volume after a sequence of harvests. On the top line, the carbon credit line, um, or the line of standing inventory on enrolled properties, we are getting just trough to peak. Now we do have a big pile of logs near the top of that graph, which everywhere else represents harvests, but we don't see a subsequent drop of volume. Now, what could happen is one year after the end of the contract period, Everyone enrolled in this program could theoretically, this wouldn't be likely of course, but they could theoretically just clear cut their land. And if we were to include that in a rolling average of enrolled properties, the result of that could very well be that the um, average inventory on enrolled properties is actually lower than the FIA baseline. 
And they're well aware of this problem. And so they understand that in order for these credits to mean anything, this increase in standing inventory has to persist over time. They call this permanence. And, and they say that they want to have this increase in volume persist for 100 years. But the contract period is only 20 years. That, I, I don't see how that's likely. And of course they do have like an insurance fund built into this program to reverse credits if in fact it does not pan out. I think they're gonna need a much bigger insurance fund. Um, this, to, to put this in perspective, the claim here is basically that if a property were to enter this program in 1924 and leave the contract in 1944, to this day, that property would have an increase in standing volume relative to the baseline because of that contract that ended 80 years ago. I mean, there is not, up here in Maine, there is not a lot of land out there that has not had a substantial harvest, which I'll say, you know, removal of at least 60% of volume. There's not a lot of land that has not seen that in the last 80 years. Likewise, even if the property were to stay in the same family, it's likely to change hands at least three times over a 100 year period. So, I mean, there's a couple of different angles they could come at this from, I suppose. So the first is basically the bad faith scenario. And uh, this is when, whether it's intentional or not, uh, the realities of what happens to this land is kind of obfuscated over the next century. Maybe the follow-up isn't as rigorous as it should have been. Maybe people just forget about it, or maybe the entire world just sinks into apocalypse and these become irrelevant. Who knows? Although if that's the case, I guess all forests are getting bigger, aren't they? And to be clear, I have full good faith assumptions here. I'm sure they have every intention to follow up on things properly, uh, but the carbon market in general has had its share of bad faith actors, so just something to consider. Second, maybe they're depending on a high degree of rollovers into other contracts that might be contingent on how this market matures and develops. Uh, I don't really know how that would work. But third is what I think is most likely just based on other things they've written across their website. And uh, I think they, like myself, very much believe that the economics of forestry do favor longer rotation ages, do favor growing older wood, but it can be kind of hard to convince people of that because at least initially, you do have to have like a 20 year period of not doing anything. And then after that 20 year period, if you can get them over that hump and perhaps pay them for that hump, um, then you can convince them that it's better to get the same amount of money for harvesting 20% of their standing volume than 50% of their standing volume. And then you can more easily have that lighter harvest in perpetuity. I'd love to see that. I'm just not sure how realistic it is. And that's really the main problem here. It's not that this is absolutely absurd. It's not that it's impossible for this sort of outcome. Uh, I just think it's highly dependent on hope and doesn't rely on much else. Now, some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, this all sounds bad, but they do advertise themselves as being third party certified. Yeah, there's something I want to explain to you about that. And this is true, not just in forestry, not just for these carbon credits. This is true about everything and just kind of the way the world works. Third party certification is not neutral certification. If the third party certifier has its business model built around a certain industry, it has a vested interest in protecting that industry. It can undermine certain products to a degree, but it fundamentally cannot undermine the industry it's built its business model around. And like I said, this is true of other certifiers within the world of forestry, such as SFI and FSC. Uh, this is true outside of forestry with, for example, credit ratings agencies in the world of finance. And that's exactly what happened during 2008, by the way, is you had these ratings agencies like Moody's and Standard & Poor's, and they were rating mortgage bonds. Now, they might be able to undermine a single mortgage, but they fundamentally could not uh, rate these bonds appropriately, otherwise they would have undermined the entire market, and that was their business, was the entire market. So when you look at these third-party certifier certifying carbon credits, I truly believe that if any of these certifiers were extremely rigorous in their criteria, they would not have any credits to certify. So listen, <clears throat> I would love to say that this is just a small problem and that this market just needs to mature and develop more. No, I think this entire market is a joke. 
it will always be a joke and I'm calling shenanigans. So there's two types of people I want to address right now. The first is the landowners out there who are listening thinking, uh-huh, I hear you, but do they pay me money? I understand you. The answer is yes. Um, there are a lot of situations where this could actually represent an advantageous option for you. Uh, if your land is at just such a point where you don't really want to do any uh, substantial harvesting in the next 20 years and you could get paid for doing some essentially timber stand improvement programs, absolutely. You're basically just getting uh, free money to improve your land. Uh, so you're going to increase your assets and not really incur much of a cost. And that's great. I'm just going to call a spade a spade. These are subsidies. Uh, they might have the facade of being privately funded. And that's a key word, facade. Um, but they're, they're a Rube Goldberg machine subsidy. They are to trees what ethanol is to corn. So if somebody's just throwing free money at you, even if it's a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine, yeah, you, you might as well take it if it works with your other interests on the land, of course. Now, the other group of people I want to address are the people I would refer to as the uh, institution of forestry. These are the people that have an interest in the integrity of forestry and forestry as a brand. So these would be your large landowners, your uh, universities and academics, perhaps your landowner associations, your NGOs, and, and so forth. I fear you guys have made a big error in pushing these to the degree that you have. And the nature of this error is both economic and philosophical. So to discuss why, I wanna return briefly to that spotted owl situation in the 1990s. So the, um, obviously that was about this specific species of owl, but the subtext to that was so much greater. That was essentially the first cultural confrontation between environmentalism and the forest industry. And the subtext there was that forests provide a whole lot of values for the entirety of society and the forest industry was not properly valuing these attributes. The response from the forest industry was that even though there are a lot of values in a forest, these are all values that are properly accounted for and carefully balanced by private landowners and private industry. And of course, this was the Forest Service, so it was public, but like I said, subtext. And that argument is fundamentally correct. Granted, there are individual actors that could be doing much better, but on the whole, uh, American landowners have done a great job preserving forests and all that they provide to society, such as wildlife, such as water, such as carbon storage and everything else. And that's why that the uh, American tree farm system has on its signs, if I remember this correctly, water, wildlife, and recreation. And that's the argument being made by that sign. I, as a private landowner, am a good steward to the attributes for which there is no single beneficiary. With these carbon credits, you guys have had a few nickels tossed your way. And you said, wait a minute, hold up. We were wrong. We've actually been doing this wrong for decades. Uh, we, we haven't been properly valuing the, the attributes of our forests. And um, just by changing our behaviors a little bit, we can produce all this value for society that reaches a decent percent of the total value of timber on the land. You guys are thinking that's a good thing, but you have fundamentally undermined every argument you have made for the last 30 years. You have said that the market has been inefficient, the market hasn't been properly valuing all the benefits of a forest, and once those attributes are properly valued, because again, we're just looking at carbon here, which wasn't really identified as a real attribute until maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, just by looking at one of those attributes, we can produce all this value. And what you are acknowledging is that private land ownership has fundamentally failed. So if you want to get into like the base economic arguments here, this is all about something called the free rider problem and what would be called a public good. So all the benefits of a forest, uh, like wildlife, like atmospheric gar carbon storage, which is global, there isn't a single beneficiary. Everyone benefits from these things. And so the landowner can't be properly compensated um, for valuing these attributes and promoting them. So naturally the market's going to be inefficient at producing these attributes. And so the argument is that forests are a public good. They should be collectively managed or regulated as a public good to ensure market efficiency. Uh, so other things that are argued to be public goods are roads, um, lighthouses back when those were important. Um, those are kind of the classic Econ 101 examples. 
So by pushing this carbon market and theoretically demonstrating um, that forest management could have been a lot better had the market been more efficient, you are actually making the argument that forests are a public good. And eventually, this will backfire on you. There will be an intelligent politician, they are rare, but they do exist, a reasonably intelligent politician is going to look at this and say, huh, why are we doing this silly Rube Goldberg machine thing with the voluntary market when we can just um, secure this benefit for all of human civilization and just regulate our forests better? And they can do this very easily. They could enact a um, basal area removal restriction. They could uh, regulate forests by quadratic mean DBH um, and so forth. It's very often the case that regulation follows market innovation. Look no further than electric vehicles for an example. Uh, 10 years ago, nobody was talking about phasing out the internal combustion engine because electric vehicles were a joke. But then Tesla came on, uh, they made electric vehicles viable, they made them cool and appealing. And now there's a lot of states that are talking about phasing out the internal combustion engine by 2035 or whatever date they have set. And when they start talking about regulating forests as a public good, you will have no leg to stand on to argue against them because you have already argued against yourself and validated their argument for them based on a lie. And that lie is that these carbon credits represent anything meaningful. <clears throat> now, the other issue here is philosophical or even theological. And I'm probably gonna lose some of you on this one, but that's okay. Um, ecology is a science. A climate science is a science. Environmentalism is an ideology. And in a very Nietzschean sense, ideology always has elements of religiosity. And so you see these recurrences of themes and motifs of religion in ideological spheres. Ideology is secularist religion and environmentalism is no different. What we have here with these carbon credits is an environmentalist recreation of sin and atonement but it's a very particular recreation of sin and atonement. It matches a system the Catholic Church had 500 years ago, and uh, it was called indulgences. And to oversimplify them, these indulgences were fees paid to the Catholic Church for the forgiveness of sins and release of souls from purgatory. These indulgences were the catalyst for the Protestant Reformation, spearheaded by a man named Martin Luther, who wrote an essay against these indulgences titled 95 Theses. And what I find very interesting is if you actually look at environmentalist critiques of this carbon credit system, um, <clears throat> they mirror uh, Martin Luther's 95 theses very closely. Like all you have to do is change a few words and it's a one-to-one -one comparison. Now, why is that a problem? Well, because you guys have put yourself in the position of the Catholic Church in this battle, and that is a disadvantaged place to be. Think about it this way. Uh, if carbon credits represent a sacrament of atonement and keeping trees on the stump is the basis of the sacrament, then timber harvesting, cutting down trees, is an object of sin. There's no way around that. Now, you guys don't see it this way because most of you are coming at it from economic or otherwise pragmatic academic approaches and saying, no, we're just, we're just scientifically trying to balance out carbon. We're just carbon accountants or something like that. And you see it as a way to bring um, new revenue streams and develop a market for landowners. That's admirable, but you don't fully understand the rules of the game you're playing. Um, you're coming at this from an economic perspective and fundamentally it's an ideological or theological perspective and you put yourself in a very bad spot. So rest assured, the Protestants are coming and they will attempt to seize from your control the keys to the kingdom of heaven. They're gonna go after timber harvesting. That's, that's the analogy I'm making. So anyway, it's probably appropriate to talk about sin because a quote that keeps coming to my mind is a quote from Dostoevsky from, I believe, Crime and Punishment. Your greatest sin is that you betrayed and destroyed yourself for nothing. So I'm going to leave it there for today, but don't forget, if you are interested in real tangible forest management and growing real trees that you can cut down and turn into real logs to benefit real people, then grab a copy of my How to Read Your Forest. You can get it for free by following the link below in the description and in the comments. And of course, don't forget, we now have the Silvicultural Community, which is now up and running and free to join. It's essentially a, a social network for people interested in managing their forests. So if you're interested, why don't you go and give that a look? All right, guys, I'll see you later.